So thank you very much for this invitation. And it's a pleasure to talk here in the session with Yifang Wang, who's taught us about a very exciting perspective for particle physics in the next half century. And also at the other poll, a session with Kevin Casello, who's just told us about a fascinating theoretical insight that's intimately related with a lot of things in string theory. So a lot of people notice that my title is very similar to the title of the last talk. And that's actually because I'll be talking about the work of the last speaker. So when I gave this title and planned to talk about Kevin Costello's work, I didn't realize that Kevin would be talking at this conference. And when I realized that, I thought maybe that meant my talk was extraneous and I should pick another topic. But finally, I decided that I, thought, I think what he's done is really exciting. And I wanted to talk about it anyway, even though it involves some duplication with what you've just heard. So as I just said, you've just heard about his approach to integrable spin systems. And I'll just be saying a little more about it. So I start by drawing a space-time picture of, el of elastic scattering at low of two particles. So this is in a world of one space and one time dimension. Well, for a moment, look at the any dimension. So here we're just elastically scattering two particles. I guess it's one plus one dimension because I'm not considering the scattering angle. Because of energy and momentum conservation, the outgoing particles go off at the same velocity as the incoming ones. So I've drawn lines with the same slope coming in and going out. There are time delays in scattering, but they would make the picture more complicated, so I've ignored them. But the time delay means that the outgoing particle is parallel to the incoming one, but with a little bit of a delay. Now, in a typical relativistic quantum field theory, there are particle production processes, which are a large part of what makes quantum field theory interesting and also a large part of what makes quantum field theory rich enough to describe the real world. So here I've drawn a picture of two particles going to three. And again, I'm ignoring time delays. But macroscopically, the outgoing particles are represented by three lines in space-time that all come from a common source. To within a microscopic error that depends on the masses of the particles and the ranges of the forces. The symmetries of typical relativistic field theories allow such processes. However, in two space-time dimensions, there are integrable field theories that have extra symmetries that move a particle in space by an amount that depends on its velocity. Then particle production is not possible. So here's a process with two going to three. And now I apply a symmetry that moves particles by an amount that depends on velocity. So <clears throat> Each line is displaced parallel to itself by an amount that depends on its slope. So now three lines that came from a common point are displaced to three lines that don't come to a common point. And therefore, after applying a symmetry to the final state and also the initial state, so you take this two going to three process, which in an ordinary quantum field theory makes sense. In a theory that has a symmetry that moves particles by an amount that depends on their velocity, the picture doesn't make sense, or more exactly, the symmetry can transform it to a picture that doesn't make sense. So in these systems, which are called integrable systems, <clears throat> there's no two going to three, but there still is two particles elastic scattering, because two lines in the plane do generically intersect. Even if I move one by some amount parallel to itself, it'll still intersect the other, and the picture will still make sense. So actually, there I've moved both of them by different amounts, but the picture still makes sense. Well, how do we characterize a particle? A particle has a velocity, but in relativistic terms, it's better to speak of the rapidity theta, where the energy and momentum are the mass times cosh theta and cinch theta. And the scattering of two particles with rapidities theta 1 and theta 2 depends only on the rapidity difference, theta 1 minus theta 2, which I'll call theta. That's the content of Lorentz invariance for two going to two scattering, is that the scattering only depends on the rapidity difference. So remember, the slope of a line depends on the rapidity or velocity of the corresponding particle. But the amplitude to scatter two particles of rapidities theta one and theta two is in general not only a function of theta, because there may be different types of particles of the same mass. An obvious reason for that 
is that the theory might have a symmetry group G, and the particles may be in some representation rho of G. So the picture is then more like this. There's a rapidity difference theta. Particles of type I and J come in. Particles of type K and L go out. You can think of I, J, K, and L as basis vectors for our representation. And we write R, I, J, K, L of theta for the quantum mechanical amplitude that describes this process. Well, R is almost the same as the S matrix. But in discussing integral systems, an overall phase of the, R, of the S matrix is unimportant. Uh, and the R matrix is just the S matrix with an overall phase not specified. So, but anyway, people working on integral systems call it the R matrix, not the S matrix. The real fun comes when we consider three particles in the initial and final state. Since we can move them relative to each other, leaving their slopes or rapidities fixed, we can assume there are only pairwise collisions, but there are two ways to do this. There are two generic ways for three to three scattering to be described as a sequence of three pairwise collisions namely the pictures on the left and on the right. And in a theory that has symmetries that can move particles by velocity-dependent amounts, these pictures must be equivalent. So in more detail, the equivalent of these pictures leads to the celebrated Yang-Baxter equation, which if you write it out with all its indices and all the R matrices is a horrible looking mess, so we might abbreviate it like this, but what it says is that this scattering with particles i, j, and k going to l, m, and o the intermediate states being Q, R, and S, is equivalent to this one with a different set of intermediate states, U, V, and T. Of course, you sum over the intermediate states on both left and right, and you have to get the same result. So that's a nonlinear relation on the R matrix. So the history of integral spin systems and also integrable relativistic theories in two space, two space or space-time dimensions, are studied by a lot of illustrious people, has given a lot of traditional solutions of the Yang-Baxter equation, which are classified by a Lie group G and a representation rho, with some bells and whistles. First, there are some restrictions on rho, and in some cases, G. And secondly, there's the curious fact that to me, for most of the last 30 years, seemed completely crazy, that in many important cases, the model associated to a given group G does not actually have G symmetry. In fact, there are three broad classes of solutions of Yang-Baxter called rational, trigonometric, and elliptic, and only the rational ones have G symmetry. So uh, there's a huge, huge story here, and I really believe Kevin's assertion was correct when he claimed that this perspective should shed a new light on basically all facets of this story. Now, I've motivated my introduction by talking about relativistic scattering, but the same solutions of Yang-Baxter are used for physical models of a completely different sort. The ones most relevant today, which you heard about from Kevin, are integral lattice models of statistical mechanics, which are constructed directly from a solution of the Yang-Baxter equation. So you draw on the plane a lot of horizontal lines and a lot of vertical lines. In Kevin's talk, they were Wilson operators. And OK, I've repeated this very busy picture. We label the vertical lines by rapidities and the horizontal lines by rapidities. Here I took all the vertical lines to have the same rapidity theta, but I gave different rapidities to the horizontal lines. And then each segment between two vertices is labeled by a basis vector in the representation, i, j, or k, and so on, with lots of indices in that picture. And a crossing is labeled by the corresponding R matrix. Then you define a model of statistical mechanics where the partition function is computed by summing over all labels, with each set of labels being weighted by the product of the R matrix elements. So this is a model of statistical mechanics with four spin interactions, because the basic interaction vertex R label, uh, relates four spins on neighboring lines. So in many cases, you can specialize it to a two-spin interaction. For example, the Ising model is the most famous integrable lattice model. And a special case of this picture reduces to two decoupled Ising models. So basically, all the integrable spin systems you know about 
uh, arise from this construction. That's a, a synthesis of a lot of wisdom of a lot of people. And these models turn out to be solvable because the transfer matrices commute, which means using the Yang-Baxter equation, the horizontal lines can be moved up and down past each other. So it's a long story to actually compute the partition function, but the starting point is that the transfer matrices commute. Now, perhaps the most obvious question about the Yang-Baxter equation is why solutions of this highly overdetermined equation exist. Well, there's another area in which one finds something a lot like the Yang-Baxter equation. That's the theory of knots in three dimensions. So in knot theory, well, you usually or often describe knots by projecting them to a plane and then giving some equivalences among such knot projections. Those equivalences are called Weidemeister moves. And here's perhaps the most important Weidemeister move. This picture is equivalent to this one. Now, <clears throat> there's an obvious resemblance to the Yang-Baxter equation, but there are equally important differences. First, in knot theory, one strand passes over or under the other, and that was important in this picture here. I, in the picture, I specified which one draws above the other by not breaking it, or, let's say here, where you can see better, not breaking it, this one goes underneath. But in Yang-Baxter, the two lines just cross in the plane, and there's no notion of under or over. Also, in knot theory, there's another right of most remove that has no analog for Yang-Baxter. So these are two senses in which knot theory is richer than Yang-Baxter. In Yang-Baxter, you don't care about over and under, but in knot theory, you do. And in knot theory, you're allowed to compare these two, and that doesn't have an analog for Yang-Baxter. So those are structures present in knot theory and not in Yang-Baxter theory, but there's also an important difference in the opposite direction. In Yang-Baxter theory, the spectral parameter, sorry, I called it rapidity so far, but in people specializing in integrable systems refer to the rapidity theta as the spectral parameter. So in Yang-Baxter theory, the spectral parameter is crucial, but it has no analog in knot theory. So there are obvious similarities, very tempting ones, between knot theory and Yang-Baxter theory, but the three differences I just mentioned are equally important. Still, there is an obvious analogy, so let's pursue it a little bit. As I've said, the usual solutions of Yang-Baxter depend on the choice of a group G and a representation rho. There are knot invariants that depend on the same data. The prototype was the Jones polynomial, that was discovered by von Jones by now more than 30 years ago. To describe them, at least formally, we work in three dimensions, and we take, we let A be a gauge field of G, which is a connection on some G bundle over a three-manifold or three-dimensional space-time. And we, but, so we do three-dimensional gauge theory, the only difference being that we take the action to be not the usual Yang-Mills action, but the churn simons action. <coughs> Or more exactly, we usually take the action to be k times the turn simons action, where k is an integer. Now, the important difference of this from standard Yang-Mills theory is that there's no metric tensor needed in defining the action. So since there's no metric tensor, Yang-Mills theory with this action is going to be a topological quantum field theory. We could work on any three manifold, but for today, just take the three manifold to be R3. And now let k be a knot embedded in R3, like the trefoil knot that I've drawn there. Now we pick a representation row, and we introduce the Wilson operator, which is just the trace of the holonomy of the gauge field integrated around the knot, with the trace taken in the representation row. And the usual quantum knot invariants are simply expectation values of the Wilson operator. And you should study the quantum renormalization, but um, for brevity, I'll just say that formally this gives topological invariance because there was no metric tensor involved in the construction. Now, from the knot invariance you get make this way, you can't really extract the usual solutions of Yang-Baxter since we're missing the spectral parameter. But it was shown by um, <clears throat> mathematicians in the 80s, actually, I'm sorry, I forget the reference now, that in a sense from these knot invariants, you can extract a special case of the usual Yang-Baxter solutions 
in which the spectral parameter is taken to I infinity. So that's very tempting, and you'd like to know how to generalize this picture to get real Yang-Baxter theory with the spectral parameter rather than just Yang-Baxter theory at I infinity. So that's the problem that was stuck for um, about a quarter century, or I think maybe well, at least a quarter century until the work of Kevin Costello. So how can we modify or generalize turn simons gauge theory to include the spectral parameter? A naive idea is to replace the finite dimensional gauge group G with its loop group, which I'll call LG. I want to stress that this is the naive loop group, not the central extension of the loop group that we meet in conformal field theory, but just the naive loop group, the group of maps of a circle to G with no central extension. We parameterize the loop by an angle theta. Then the loop group has representations that live out of a particular value of theta. So the loop group is just the group of gauge transformations on the circle for a G gauge theory. So if you have a charged particle that lives at theta equals theta zero, it only cares what the gauge group gauge transformation is doing at theta zero. So that's the kind of representation of the gauge group that we'll consider, of the loop group that we'll consider. So we hope that this will be the spectral parameter label theta naught carried by a particle in the solution of the Yang-Baxter equation. Now taking the gauge group to be a loop group means that the gauge field now also depends on theta, and so we could write it like this. But it's important that there's no d theta term, so this is not a full four-dimensional gauge field. The churn simons action can be generalized. We still have a churn simons three form, and if we multiply it by the one form d theta, we can integrate it over m times s1, where s1 is the loop. This is perfectly gauge invariant. So this is the classical churn simons action of the loop group. And naively, we can use it to study knot invariants for representations that depend on theta, that is, on the spectral parameter. But something goes wrong. What goes wrong is that because there's no d by d theta term in the action, the kinetic energy of the gauge field, as mathematicians would say, it is not elliptic, and therefore the perturbation expansion is not well behaved. So in a standard gauge, the propagator from x theta to x prime theta prime has a delta function in theta because there was no d by d theta in the action. And because of the delta function, loops won't make sense. Here's a loop with two internal lines propagating from x theta to x prime theta prime. And you're going to get two factors of delta of theta minus theta prime. So you'll get delta of theta minus theta prime times delta of zero. So at that point, you have to go back to the drawing board. What Kevin Cassell did was to cure this problem via a very simple deformation. So we take our three manifold to be R3. We write x, y, and t for the three coordinates of R3. So overall, we now have x, y, t, and also theta, where theta is the loop parameter. Now we combine t and theta into a complex variable, t plus i epsilon theta, where epsilon is a real parameter. So we'll be back in the ca bad case we just discussed if epsilon is zero, but we want to do the case where epsilon isn't zero. Now, if epsilon isn't zero, we can get rid of it by rescaling t and z. So as soon as epsilon does, isn't zero, its value doesn't matter, and we can just take epsilon to be one. But I introduce epsilon to emphasize that the good case arises by an infinitesimal deformation from the bad, naive bad case. <clears throat> so now, uh, in the action, we replace d theta by dz, or dz divided by Planck's constant. And now we regard A as a partial gauge field in R3 times a circle that's missing a dz term rather than missing a d theta term as before. And now the action is the one that Costello described. Now we've lost the three-dimensional symmetry of standard turn simons theory because of splitting away one of the three coordinates of R3 and combining it with theta. We still have two-dimensional topological symmetry. But as we discussed when we were comparing Yang-Baxter theory to knot theory, Yang-Baxter theory does not have three-dimensional symmetry. It only has two-dimensional symmetry. 
We've lost the symmetry that's missing in integrable systems, and we've in turn gained the spectral parameter. It turns out that if you modify standard term Simon's theory in this way, you get exactly the right properties. You get yang backs or other than not theory. The three-dimensional diffeomorphism symmetry is reduced to two-dimensional symmetry. But now, there's a spectral parameter, z, that turns out to be the spectral parameter. Sorry, there's a complex variable, z, that will be the spectral parameter. So our spectral parameters were real in the introductory part of the lecture. But in it, to integrable systems people, they think of it as a complex spectral parameter. And in the rest of the lecture, our spectral parameter is the complex variable, z. So as I've presented it so far, um, space-time is R2 times R times a circle, which is C star, parameterized by Z, with the complex one form DZ in the action. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, the action makes sense in a more general situation involving a topological two-manifold sigma and a complex Riemann surface C with a holomorphic one form. But it turns out that to make the quantum theory work, you want omega to have no zeros. Intuitively, the theory doesn't work there because it corresponds to h bar being infinite. And so it, it ends up that there are three cases of complex Riemann surfaces that work. And they correspond to the three traditional classes of solutions of the Yang-Baxter equation, rational, trigonometric, and elliptic. Now, the first point, which Costello kind of explained in his talk, is that the theory has a sensible propagator and a sensible perturbation expansion. The basic reason for a sensible propagator is that although d by dt that we had in the naive theory is not elliptic, we've now replaced it by d by dz bar, which is a good operator with a nice inverse. So after a suitable gauge fixing, the propagator is basically what Costello wrote. Here's a slightly different version of it. And that's the propagator for the case that the topological space is R2 and that the complex space is just the complex z plane with this measure. So to get a propagator requires gauge fixing. Well, the gauge fixing was done in a natural way that used this metric and gave that answer. So then with this propagator, one of Casella's main results is that the perturbation expansion is well defined. That's a tricky point, because this theory is actually unnormalizable by power counting. So on that basis, one would not expect a well-defined, quantum, well-behaved quantum theory. But the theory also has no possible counterterms, because all local gauge invariant operators vanish by the classical equations of motion. So I'm not sure what most of you would have said about a theory unnormalizable by power counting but lacking counterterms. But anyway, Cassell uses a fairly elaborate algebraic machinery to prove that the theory has a well-defined perturbation expansion. Now we consider Wilson operators, which are Holonombi operators, where to begin with, L is a loop in the topological space sigma times the complex space C. But we only have a partial gauge field that's missing a dz component. So we would not know how to do parallel transport in the z direction. And since we can't do parallel transport in the z direction, as Cassell explained, our Wilson operators have to live at a constant value of z. So L has to be a loop that lies in the topological space at a particular value of z. Now let's consider some lines that meet in the topological space in the familiar configuration associated to Yang-Baxter. So the lines now are labeled by values of z, which are constant for each line, for the reason I just explained. But still, we can draw two different pictures. Well, two-dimensional diffeomorphism invariance means we're free to move the lines around as long as we don't change the topology of the configuration. So I can move this middle line to the left or right, except that I should worry what happens when it crosses this point. So the only thing I could might happen, so the answer will be constant by two-dimensional symmetry if this line is to the left of the crossing point or if it's to the right of the crossing point. But we should worry whether there could be a discontinuity when the middle line crosses the crossing point of the left and right lines. 
but assuming Z1, Z2, and Z3 are all distinct. The well-definedness of the perturbation expansion ensures that there is no discontinuity when the, middle, uh, when the middle line is moved from the left to the right, because there's actually no singularity in the full four-dimensional picture, since the three lines are not intersecting in four dimensions. There are different values of z. So the propagator was nice enough to make it clear that there's no discontinuity when we move the middle line from left to right. Topological symmetry says that it's constant on the left, constant on the right, and the smooth propagator says there can be no discontinuity in the middle. So that's why the two pictures are equivalent. So two configurations that differ by what we might call a Yang-Baxter move are equivalent. And likewise, in the configuration associated to integral lattice spin systems, we can move the horizontal lines up and down at will. But why is there as elementary a picture as in the lattice spin systems, where you can evaluate the path integral by labeling each line by a basis vector and each crossing by a local factor? Why is everything as elementary as that? Well, this is a little tricky and depends on picking the right boundary condition, but there's a way to make it work for each of the three classes of model. Simplest to explain is the rational case in which the complex manifold is just the complex plane. So here, the boundary condition we need is just that the gauge field is zero at infinity in the C direction, and that in quantizing, we only divide by gauge transformations that are one at infinity. Then we find that the classical solution where A is zero is unique. It has no deformations up to gauge symmetry and also no unbroken gauge symmetries. So when we expand around the trivial solution where A is zero, perturbation theory is unique. Uh, sorry, perturbation theory is straightforward conceptually. There are no unbroken gauge symmetries to worry about and no moduli to integrate over. So we just draw Feynman diagrams. And the reason we're going to get a simple answer is the same as the reason you might have worried about whether the theory existed. The theory is infrared trivial, so it's going to give a simple answer. Infrared trivial is the flip side of the fact that it's unnormalizable by power counting. So effects at long distances in the topological space are negligible. I put the phrase long distances in quotes because two-dimensional diffeomorphism invariance means there is no notion of distance on the topological space sigma, the first factor of sigma times c. A metric only entered when we fix the gauge. Remember, we used the metric dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. We could just as well take a very large real b and take e to the b times dx squared plus dy squared. That means when you look at this picture, you can consider the vertical lines and also the horizontal lines to be very far apart compared to the differences between the z's. In such a situation in an infrared free theory, effects that involve a gauge boson exchange between two lines that don't intersect are negligible. So it's like exchanging a graviton between distant galaxies. That is not going to have much influence on atomic physics in the two galaxies because gravity is infrared trivial. Now, you could worry about gauge boson exchange from one line to itself because you have to integrate over A and B so they don't have to be far apart. But there's nothing that gauge boson exchange from one line to itself can really do. Such effects correspond roughly to mass normalization and standard quantum field theory. And in the present situation for straight Wilson lines, there's really no interesting effect analogous to mass normalization that's conceivable. When two lines cross, we get an integral over A and B, and the integral converges. So infrared triviality means that if A and B are large, the propagator is small and the integral converges. So the integral converges, and it receives its significant contributions only when A and B are not much bigger than Z and minus Z prime. I'll say what it converges to in a moment. So now let's look at a general configuration like the one related to the integral lattice models. We can draw very complicated Feynman diagrams, but the complications are all localized near one crossing point or another. So we can draw a mess near any 
crossing point we want, but a contribution relating one, one line to another is negligible, and any contribution that isn't near one of the crossings is irrelevant. So away from the crossing points, since the gauge field was zero, that was the unique classical solution we're expanding around, each spin is just interacting with A equals zero, so it just behaves as a free spin. And there are interactions, but only when they cross. So now, summing up these diagrams, we get the recipe of the integral lattice model, where we have to sum over the state of the spin when it's propagating freely, and when two spins cross, we have to sum up all the effects of uh, gluons at those crossings. So this makes it clear that in the presence of the configuration of Wilson operators that Costello introduced, the path integral can be evaluated by the standard rules discovered by people who work on integral spin systems. But why is the R matrix obtained this way, the standard rational solution of Yang-Baxter, or one of the other standard solutions if we did one of those cases? Well, Kevin uh, already told you the answer in his talk, but I'll just very briefly state it. In his paper, he explicitly evaluates the lowest order correction that R is, the R matrix is one plus H bar times something. The something is usually called little r. By explicitly evaluating this diagram, it's a nice and pretty calculation that he almost did for you in his talk. And you got the standard answer that you can find in all the integral systems papers. And then once the first order deformation is known, general algebraic arguments about the Yang-Baxter uh, equation imply that the whole solution is uniquely determined by the leading correction. So I have one last comment. So Costello's theorem is about perturbation theory. He proved that to all orders of perturbation theory, the uh, path integral for his configuration of Wilson lines agrees with the perturbation theory of the integrable spin system. But his theorem shows that actually, in this particular theory, and unlike most quantum field theories, perturbation theory converges. As a physicist, one would like to give an a priori non-perturbative definition of the theory, which would have the claimed perturbative expansion. To do this, it appears one has to go to string theory and use a certain brain system, the D4 NS5 system. That step would involve ideas somewhat similar to the ones that I used in relating the Jones polynomial to the D3 NS5 system. Thank you. Well, uh, I can't completely comment on the um, string theory construction, but I will just comment on the part of your question that asked, what's the five-dimensional analog of the story I explained in this talk and that Kevin talked about in his talk? So it actually has to do with Costello's last paper, which I haven't understood very well, but it's on a 5D analog of chern simons theory, where he considers a space that has one real dimension and two complex dimensions. and there's now a partial connection that has a T component and Z bar and W bar components. And the action is DZ DW times the churn simons 3 form. And there's another, there's a story which I'm sure is at least as fascinating as this one. I wouldn't at present be competent to explain it. So I think I can't do more now than to advertise the paper. But this 60 also the same point. You can go to 60, well, 60 gives you holomorphic churn simons, which is known to be relevant to string theory because, for example, it's related to the um, super, space time superpotentials observed in certain compactifications. I doubt that it has a relation to integrable systems, although life is full of surprises. 
I was rather surprised that the five-dimensional mind is related to integrable systems. So the question, there's an analog of COVID, I'm sorry. There's a different generalization of churn Simon theory, which is Coven homology, uh, which also has, well, it has a variety of string theory realizations with the first version studied by Gukov, Hoff, and Schwartz. Um, it would be interesting to address this question to Kevin. In fact, he's here, so let's ask. <laughs> I assume you're here, Kevin, somewhere. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there's, okay. Uh, I don't know whether there's room to combine everything. So, Kovanov homology can be described by a D4 NS5 system. And this can also be described by a D4 NS5 system. But you have to do different things with them. And I'm not sure they're compatible. But there's always the D5 NS5 system. So, hope springs eternal. Let me not say no. Yes. Is the frame in the time seven play any look here? Are you asking about the framing anomaly? So, yes. Uh, um, I hit it, and Costello uh, I kind of did also, I think. So, uh, there is a framing anomaly that's more complicated than the one in usual Chern Simons theory. And if you take the topological space to be a plane, there's no framing anomaly if the lines are straight lines. So, okay. The usual integrable system arises, as Costello explains, the topological space is a torus, and the Wilson lines are circles, which you can think of as geodesics on the torus. And with nice geodesics, you don't really meet the framing anomaly. But there's something which I initially found rather surprising. But if you consider anything other than geodesics, you run into a framing anomaly. And I don't fully understand it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I know how to calculate it. And in a more abstract algebraic way, uh, um, I think it's in a more abstract way, it's known in the integrable systems literature. Um, so classically, a Wilson line has a definite value of z. I'll just tell you what the framing anomaly says. Classically, a Wilson operator has a definite value of z. But quantum mechanically, that's true if it's, the line is a geodesic. But if it bends, then um, z has to change along the Wilson line in a way that depends on the acceleration. Well, by the way, I answered you only for the framing anomaly for Wilson lines. There is a story about the framing anomaly for the two manifold. I think I'll defer on it to Costello, though. I can't quite hear the question. Sorry, speak up. The question's about the theta angle in gauge theory? No. Well, the usual theta angle in superangular theory uh, is built into this in the sense that adding a constant to z is equivalent to shifting theta by a constant. Um, so the usual theta angle of superangular doesn't give anything new, at least if you consider precisely the setup in my lecture. There might be other interesting things to do. 
I'm not certain if I understood the question, so you can ask a follow-up if I misunderstood. Um, okay, I think uh, that's like the 